Okay, let's analyze the who can stay in a haunted house the longest competition. This is not a haunted house. The mansion at 2 Wellesley Place, Toronto was built in 1899 for Rupert Simpson. He, his wife Frances, and their three daughters lived there until 1913. In 1922, it was sold to a Catholic women's order, the Sisters of Service, who used the property as their convent. In the late 1960s, it was converted into a nurse's residence for the Princess Margaret Hospital. After filming the competition for Kenny vs. Spenny, it was renovated, then restored, and sold for $3.2 million. I found no record of the house being haunted, or of Daniel Bertram Simpson III in 1870 or something. We're going into this fucking haunted house where some little girl was killed. And they found her in like 1870 or something without a fucking head. The speech he gives Spenny on the couch is just a lie to scare Spenny. So the house is not really haunted, but to get the necessary reactions for the episode, Spenny needs to believe that the house is haunted. You might ask me, wouldn't Spenny know that the house is not haunted? Yes. He would have if he was more involved in planning the competitions, but Spenny never got involved in sourcing locations, or props for that matter. Kenny indicated in several interviews that Spenny was really only involved in the filming portion of production. Everything before and after filming, he just left to Kenny and the production team. Spenny's apathy with regard to sourcing is why he was taken to a location without fish. Spenny can't catch any fish. Like, do you know an area without fish in this lake? Yeah, there's areas without fish, for sure. I thought this was a hot spot, Captain. I ain't doing so hot. Captain, should we go somewhere else? And why he got the bigger goat. Too bad you didn't order a female goat, you idiot. I asked for a female goat. Turns out the females are actually smaller. Bring two goats, bring a small one for me. I no, they should be the same size. Whether the house is haunted or not is irrelevant. The only thing that really matters is that Spenny believes the house is haunted. So let's pause here for a moment. What is this episode really about? I've already established in previous videos that Kenny vs. Spenny is not about the competitions. It's about watching Kenny manipulate and torment Spenny for our entertainment. So this isn't the who can stay in a haunted house the longest competition. This is the watch Kenny terrify Spenny through Spenny's own fears episode. Which leads me right into my next point. Spenny seeks help on dealing with ghosts, while Kenny seeks help on how to scare Spenny. I'm a storm. I'm Shadow. Spenny called us today to help him deal with ghosts in a haunted house. I have looked up Storm and Shadow in the past, and at one point they did market themselves as ghost hunters. They're still in Toronto, and as of today, they make sentimental greeting cards. Link in the description. During the episode, they tried to teach Spenny how to protect himself from ghosts. Mysterion is a real showman. He's been on America's Got Talent and other TV shows where he does a mind reading act. Kenny wants Mysterion to teach him the best ways to scare Spenny. You keep going and going and going and going until that person is so vulnerable that you are in complete control. Hey! Next, we see these renowned paranormal researchers, Patrick and Michelle. Patrick owns a ghost walk business in Burlington, Ontario, and Michelle's own website claims that she's considered one of Canada slash North America's leading researchers in malevolent hauntings. Whether ghosts are real or not is also irrelevant. These people are in the business of hunting for and studying ghosts. While they're not actors, I believe they're acting in the sense that Kenny hired them to go along with his story and scare Spenny. I think he hired these people to try to scare me. And it's working. Since they would know some of the folklore and terminology surrounding ghosts, they would be the perfect people to hire for the job. Spirits here that are earthbound. They may not necessarily see the house per se. They may be seeing things in their time. It wouldn't be the first time Kenny paid someone to be complicit in his plan. Fish. So I'll see you girls tomorrow. Absolutely. Okay. 
If the house had some kind of lore about a girl being chained up and killed, they should be familiar with the story and with the features of the house, right? They are Toronto-based ghost hunters, after all. They should be familiar with local ghost stories. They probably would have been in this house before, and they probably wouldn't be discovering this chain ring for the first time. Oh my god, look at that! Oh my god! Chain thing! And if she was familiar with it, she certainly wouldn't call it a chain thing. A chain thing! I know, I know. This evidence is speculation at best, but I notice they're kind of clutching at straws within the house to build on Kenny's previously established narrative. So they kept Lily locked in a closet upstairs. They also seize opportunities to plant seeds of fear in Spenny. They can't punch me or scratch me. Or oh, of course they can. Yeah, they can. Even though they can't really explain themselves. The energy changes at night. Sorry. Why? Because it gets that's cooler. just us. It, it what cooler. we have in the day and what we have at night is two different things. I believe they know that the house is not haunted, but they're exploiting Spenny's fears for Kenny to prey on later in the night. After doing a bit of research, the best I can come up with is that this ring is for securing a door in an open position. It's under a window, but there may be a door over here. We never get a good shot of the other wall in the room. Let me know in the comments what you think it's for. Anyway, the voice telling this ghost story he and his young wife, Margaret, intended to start a large family. They unfortunately couldn't conceive. If I play with the audio, I'm pretty sure that's Sebi. He and his young wife, Margaret, intended to start a large family. They unfortunately couldn't conceive. Let me know in the comments who you think that is. Next is 24 F-bombs and an already petrified Spenny. Fucking fuck, fucking fuck, fucking fucking fuck, fucking fucking fuck, fucking 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 fuckers, fuck. Fucking fucking suckers! Fucking fucking motherfucker fucking fucking Did you hear that? Kenny's montage of pranks on Spenny include dressing in period clothes. I shall return momentarily with your food, sir. Is that supposed to make me scared? Don't put on costumes, it freaks me out. Pretending to hear something in the basement. Something in the basement. Holy fuck! Ah! We heard something in the basement. Okay, there's someone down there. There's someone down there, man. A jump scare? Kenny! Kenny! Oh, Getting sodomized by a specter? Mr. Simpson, no! Help me! I've been raped by a ghost! Orally assaulted by an apparition? Oh, 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 oh. And impregnated by a poltergeist? Yes. Haunted, Can we stop me. everything? This isn't the right time to have a ghost, baby. I saved this one for last because I think its execution was perfect. And this is the grave that they dug when they found her. This is too fucking freaky. Come on. I don't like it. <gasps> oh my god! Oh my god! There's no way! Oh my god. Oh, oh. Back to the flashlight, loser! Hey! Remember when Mysterion told Kenny? Don't give it all away at once. Let him discover some of the things himself. Well, Kenny leads Spenny into this room with the shoes in the grave. And even though Kenny can see the shoes right here, he says nothing until Spenny finds them too. At which point he steals Spenny's flashlight and runs away. Given that Mysterion's teachings were somewhat implicit and could be practiced with different techniques, I think Kenny did an excellent job applying them to manipulate Spenny's fears. So after being terrorized for about eight minutes of screen time, Spenny chains himself to the radiator, disrupting Kenny's plan to continue leading Spenny around the house and scaring him out. Get comfortable or get out, because I'm not losing this competition. Genius! Kenny tries to summon the devil, a loud bang is heard, and Kenny and the crew run out of the house. The next day they tell us that this crane fell in the night. I believe those final events are fabricated and are not at all what they appear to be. I'm going to start with the crane and work backwards. This is not a crane. This is a concrete boom pump truck. I'm going to say it right now. The bang we hear in the episode was added during editing. The boom pump did not fall in the night for two reasons. Number one, after the day's work is done, the boom is folded back down onto the truck in the fully down position. They wouldn't leave it up to fall on a guy walking down the street in the middle of the night. And number two, 
These trucks cost between 200000 and half a million dollars. They don't leave them on the job site overnight. They take them back to the yard. It would never have been there to fall down and scare them into running out of the house. Next in our rewind, the scene where they run out of the house. Fuck off! <laughs> Holy shit! What the fuck was that? What the fuck was that? Holy shit! You guys hear that? That was fucked! Holy shit! Why does the sound disappear? Why does the camera get all shaky? Why does the frame rate change from 30 frames per second to 20 frames per second? It's actually one scene of them running out of the house and three scenes of them running down the street. I'm going to use this small building and its electrical pole as a reference point for examining the positions of Kenny and the crew. This is the road, and this is the small building. The initial exit from the house showed Kenny in the lead, and Jamie, Brendan, and Donnie following close behind. Holy shit! In the first shot, we see Kenny holding up his robe, stopping just short of the building, with Jamie running up the fence line and also stopping short of the building. Brendan in the back, and Donnie behind Kenny on the right. What the fuck was that? What the fuck was that? Holy shit! In the next shot, Kenny is alone, far back from the building. You guys hear that? You guys hear that? If I pause it just right, you can see how the electrical pole catches the light way over here. In fact, he's basically right in front of the house that he just ran out of. Look at where the production vehicles are parked. The one in front is actually just poking into the shot with Kenny. You can even see the driver's side mirror. In the final shot, Kenny stops short, maybe five meters from the building. Donnie's in front of him, jogging in a curve to the right, and Jamie and Brendan jog beside each other, past Kenny. That was fucked! Holy shit! Knowing all of that, watch it again. Fuck off! <laughs> Holy shit! What the fuck was that? What the fuck was that? Holy shit! You guys hear that? That was fucked! Holy shit! I think it's done this way to disorient the viewer into believing an extremely chaotic exit took place and that they ran away a lot further than they actually did. If you can think of a better reason, please let me know in the comments. The last part of the ending to examine is Spenny. He says, what? He doesn't exclaim, what was that? As he might if there was a loud percussive sound. What the hell was that? He just says, what? We'll examine that a bit deeper in a moment, but for now, let's have an aside, you and me, and then I'll put this all together. It's been established by myself in a previous video, and by Spenny himself, that the broadcasters indicated that Spenny has to win sometimes. Realistically speaking, outside of fluke losses like who can make more money in three days, Spenny made $1,650 on a fucking horse! Kenny would win all of the competitions. He's just that cunning and that smart. It's necessary for Spenny to win sometimes for the sake of creating a competitive atmosphere for the viewer. Otherwise, it wouldn't be Kenny versus Spenny. It would just be Kenny dominates Spenny every single time. Now, after the colossal disaster in the Bigger Balls episode, where Spenny basically demands, let me win or I'll jump off a cliff. I'll show you fucking balls. Don't fucking jump, man. You're freaking me out. Guys, I totally forfeit this competition. Spenny's the winner. Get away from the fucking cliff. I think the broadcasters took measures to prevent future episodes from being hijacked into forfeiture. They still wanted Spenny to win sometimes, but they took a different approach in order to keep Spenny competitive. I think they probably said something to Kenny privately along the lines of, we're not going to dictate which ones he has to win because it affects his ability to compete. You, Kenny, are going to have to choose which competitions he's going to win and guide him to victory so it appears natural for the viewer. Maybe not exactly that, but something like that. Now someone may say to me, but Mr. Facts and Fun, what about season six? Kenny won every competition with the exception of two. Who's the bigger idiot and who can produce the best commercial? What happened to the broadcaster saying, let Spenny win more often? Listen, I've heard Kenny say in no less than two interviews that he knew season six was going to be their last season before they even started filming. 
At that point, it became irrelevant whether Spenny won or lost. Kenny stopped giving a damn about what the broadcasters wanted. This point's reinforced by the final competition, who can stay on an island the longest. As his way of giving the broadcaster one final F.U., Kenny found an extremely cunning way to disguise an all-expenses-paid vacation to Cuba as a competition. Give Haven't what? we given the, the fans and the broadcasters enough? They've been milking our blood and sweat for years. They have to pay for us to be here until we finish the competition. You're a we can literally you know be what? here for months. It was his way of rewarding his friends for helping to make the show what it was. Cuba, Cuba, Cuba. Ba, 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 ba. Well, okay. But why didn't Kenny win those other two season six competitions? And the answers are simple and complex. Number one, because Kenny is certainly not an idiot. I am the biggest idiot. That's right. And number two, for reasons I'm going to discuss when I analyze the commercial competition. So does that mean the episodes are scripted since I say Spenny has to win sometimes? No, not at all. Both Kenny and Spenny were trying to win until Kenny hit a roadblock. You see, the episodes cost around $400,000 to make. Link at the top. The broadcasters don't just hand over that money and wave goodbye. They want to see some kind of business plan for each episode on how their money is going to be spent. This is where beats come in. Beats are a very rough, brainstormed idea of how the competition will play out. In this Haunted House episode, Kenny's beats are tell Spenny that the house is haunted, learn the art of scaring people, get experts to validate the story, prey on Spenny's fears through a series of pranks, summon the devil, X, and we'll come back to this, then Spenny leaves the house and Kenny wins. Spenny's beats include enter the house, don't leave the house, win. He even says so right here. Because the reality is I just have to stay in this house and I'll win this competition. And that's normally how these competitions beat out. Kenny has plans and Spenny just thinks he'll win by either following the rules or forcing a tie. Many fans of the show interpret these beats as scripting because when the film is condensed into an episode, we just see pranks and reactions. As Sebi Kluwer once said, beats are more of a roadmap for the broadcasters to understand what we're going to do with their money. Once filming starts, we may throw away the map, or we may take a different route. Which is how this whole thing can fuck up. And that's exactly what happened here. They were forced to take a different route. Genius! Look at Kenny's face after Spenny chains himself up. That is the face of a man who realized that he's not going to win this competition. Then I'm in control. He thought he would be able to scare Spenny out of the house, but it's become clear that this competition will either be a draw or a Spenny win. And that's one of the reasons why I don't think this episode could be called scripted. Kenny didn't plan for Spenny to handcuff himself. It just happened. And therefore, Kenny has to adapt his own plan. This is where X comes in. X was supposed to be a finale grand enough to scare Spenny out of the house. Kenny definitely planned on summoning the devil as his finale, because he brought a degloved goat's head along with chalk, candles, and a robe. But what we don't know is how the summoning was supposed to end. We only know that it was supposed to be big enough to scare Spenny out of the house. Maybe an actor was going to come out dressed as Satan, or a child would come out dressed as a headless ghost. I think I might need an abortion. We don't know. But at this point, Kenny knew Spenny wasn't leaving. And since Spenny has to win sometimes, Kenny might as well guide the competition towards an organic Spenny win in order to appease the broadcasters. So let's examine Spenny's reaction a little bit closer. I noticed that Spenny's reaction to the bang is not what I would have expected it to be. He just kind of gets a little startled and lifts his hand off his leg and then shouts out, What? My explanation for this scene is purely speculative, but also based on my belief that the loud banging sound was added by the editor during post-production. I believe that while doing his summoning chant, Kenny chose an arbitrary moment to react and run out of the house. Kenny shouting, what the F, is actually what startled Spenny. They just delayed the audio by a fraction of a second and added the bang so that Spenny's reaction is timed to the bang and not to Kenny's outburst. The crew doesn't react to the bang, 
and it's not until Kenny runs by the cinematographer that the crew turns tail and runs. That's why Spenny immediately looks at Kenny and not at the ceiling, the crew, or another part of the house as the source of the sound which startled him. After a moment, he then turns to the crew to see if they're seeing something that he's not seeing. If I slow it down and advance the audio and delete the bang, doesn't it look and sound like Kenny is the one who startled Spenny? Kenny's arbitrary outburst is what led to Spenny saying, what? I can extrapolate that to mean, what are you reacting to? Or, what are you running for? If Spenny had heard a bang, he would be saying, what was that? What the hell was that? Not simply, what? 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 Beyond my personal beliefs, the images are too grainy to compare the timing of the audio to the movement of their mouths. Supporting this conjecture is more speculation. Why would they choose to shoot Spenny and then cut to this shot right at the moment of the bang? Wouldn't it make for better television to see one long shot of Kenny doing his chant and then suddenly reacting to the noise without cutting? See dingo. Wouldn't it be more visually pleasing for a continuous shot where they cut the music right before something big happens? Like this moment in Touch the Ground. What if they edited Touch the Ground in a similar way? It would look like this. Is the cut done to create more chaos? Is it done to hide conflicting reaction times? Am I being too critical? I can say for sure, given the editing experience I've gained since starting this channel, and years of watching and re-watching Kenny vs. Spenny, that I would have been much more satisfied to see this shot done in a continuous fashion. And finally, the running away scene. This was shot at least three times. Look at them run up to or past the building in different orders on the street. So if something scared them enough that they made a chaotic exit from the house, why would they need to reshoot that once, let alone three times and then combine the footage? Like I said in a previous video, this is not necessarily damning evidence, but this was one of the first things I noticed when I started preparing the video. So it raised some red flags. Why would they do that? Even if it's a reshoot, why wouldn't one shot be enough? What are they trying so hard to convince me of here? And because I perceive this strange arrangement as a red flag, I studied the scenes surrounding it much more closely. So having said all that, here's the short version of the big answer. I think after Spenny handcuffed himself to the radiator, Kenny accepted his fate, played out his devil summoning finale, and ran out of the house to surrender the win because Spenny has to win sometimes and draws are BS. Okay, I hate fucking ties. Ties are bullshit. In my opinion, Kenny performed the Satan summoning finale as an organic way to scare himself out. He couldn't just walk out of the house and surrender because he's not allowed to just forfeit. The viewer had to see him leave for a reason which was related to the haunted house. Furthermore, something so frightening had to happen that everyone ran out, not just Kenny. That's the only way it could have been. Speaking as a fan of the show since 2007, it pains me to say this ending was fake. To be clear, it wasn't scripted, but it was fake. Opinions and hypotheses in the comments. Happy Halloween, and thanks for watching.